Chapter 3 A Queer Story and a New Friend Three children stared at George in the greatest surprise. George stared back at them. What do you mean? said Dick at last. Kieran Island can't belong to you. You're just boasting. No, I'm not, said George. You ask Mother. If you're not going to believe what I say, I won't tell you another word more. But I don't tell untruths. I think it's being a coward if you don't tell the truth, and I'm not a coward. Julian remembered that Aunt Fanny had said that George was absolutely truthful, and he scratched his head and looked at George again. How could she be possibly telling the truth? Well, of course we'll believe you if you tell us the truth, he said. But it does sound a bit extraordinary, you know. Really it does. Children don't usually own islands, even funny little ones like that. It isn't a funny little island, said George fiercely. It's lovely. There are rabbits there, as tame as can be. And the big cormorants sit on the other side, and all kinds of gulls go there. The castle is wonderful too, even if it is all in ruins. It sounds fine, said Dick. How does it belong to you, Georgina? George glared at him and didn't answer. Sorry, said Dick hastily. I didn't mean to call you Georgina. I meant to call you George. Go on, George. Tell us how the island belongs to you, said Julian, slipping his arm through his sulky little cousins. She pulled away from him at once. Don't do that, she said. I'm not sure that I want to make friends with you yet. All right, all right, said Julian, losing patience. Be enemies or anything you like. We don't care, but we like your mother awfully and we don't want her to think we won't make friends with you. Do you like my mother? said George, her bright blue eyes softening a little. Yes, she's a dear, isn't she? Well, all right. I'll tell you how Kirin Castle belongs to me. Come and sit down here in this corner where nobody can hear us. They all sat down in a sandy corner of the beach. George looked across at the little island in the bay. It's like this, she said. Years ago, my mother's people owned nearly all the land round here. Then they got poor and had to sell most of it. They could never sell that little island because nobody thought it worth anything, especially as the castle had been ruined for years. Fancy nobody wanting to buy a dear little island like that, said Dick. I'd buy it at once if I had the money. All that's left of what Mother's family owned is our own house, Kirin Cottage, and a farm a little way off, and Kirin Island, said George. Mother says when I'm grown up it will be mine. She says she doesn't want it now either, so she's sort of given it to me. It belongs to me. It's my own private island. And I don't let anyone go there unless they get my permission. The three children stared at her. They believed every word George said, for it was quite plain that the girl was speaking the truth. Fancy having an island of your very own. They thought she was very lucky indeed. Oh, Georgina! <gasps> I mean, George, said Dick. I do think you're lucky. It looks such a nice island. I hope you'll be friends with us and take us there one day soon. You simply can't imagine how we'd love it. Well, I might, said George pleased at the interest she had caused. 
I see. I never have taken anyone there yet, though some of the boys and girls round here have begged me to. But I don't like them, so I haven't. There was a little silence as the four children looked out over the bay to where the island lay in the distance. The tide was going out. It almost looked as if they could wade over to the island. Dick asked if it was possible. No, said George. I told you, it's only possible to get to it by boat. It's farther out than it looks. And the water is very, very deep. There are rocks all about too. You have to know exactly where to row a boat, or you bump into them. It's a dangerous bit of coast here. There are lots of wrecks about. Wrecks! cried Julian, his eyes shining. I say, I've never seen an old wreck. Are there any to see? Not now. Said George, "They've all been cleared up, except one, and that's the other side of the island. It's deep down in the water. You can just see the broken mast if you row over it on a calm day and look down into the water. That wreck really belongs to me too." This time, the children really could hardly believe George. But she nodded her head firmly. Yes, she said. It was a ship belonging to one of my great, great, great grandfathers, or someone like that. He was bringing gold, big bars of gold, back in his ship, and it got wrecked off Kirin Island. Oh, what happened to the gold? Asked Anne. Her eyes round and big. Nobody knows," said George. "I expect it was stolen out of the ship. Divers have been down to see, of course, but they couldn't find any gold. Golly, this does sound exciting," said Julian. "I wish I could see the wreck. Well, we might perhaps go this afternoon when the tide is right down," said George. The water is so calm and clear today, we could see a bit of it. Oh, how wonderful! Said Anne. I do so want to see a real live wreck. The others laughed. Well, it won't be very alive, said Dick. I say, George, what about a bathe? I must go and get Timothy first, said George. She got up. Who's Timothy? Said Dick. Can you keep a secret? Said George. Nobody must know at home. Well, go on. What's the secret? Asked Julian. You can tell us. We're not sneaks. Timothy is my very greatest friend. Said George. I couldn't do without him. But mother and father don't like him, so I have to keep him in secret. I'll go and fetch him. She ran off up the cliff path. The others watched her go. They thought she was the queerest girl they had ever known. Who in the world can Timothy be? Wondered Julian. Some fisher boy, I suppose, that George's parents don't approve of. The children lay back in the soft sand and waited. Soon, they heard George's clear voice coming down from the cliff behind them. "Come on, Timothy! Come on!" They sat up and looked to see what Timothy was like. They saw no fisher boy, but instead a big black and white mongrel dog with an absurdly long tail. And a big, wide mouth that really seemed to grin. He was bounding all round George, mad with delight. She came running down to them. "This is Timothy," she said. "Don't you think he's simply perfect?" As a dog, 
Timothy was far from perfect. He was the wrong shape. His head was too big. His ears were too pricked. His tail was too long. And it was quite impossible to say what kind of dog he was supposed to be. But he was such a mad, friendly, clumsy, laughable creature that every one of the children adored him at once. Oh, you darling, said Anne, and got a lick on the nose. I say, isn't he grand, said Dick, and gave Timothy a friendly smack that made the dog bound madly all round him. I wish I had a dog like this, said Julian, who really loved dogs and had always wanted one of his own. Oh, George, he's fine. Aren't you proud of him? The little girl smiled, and her face altered at once and became sunny and pretty. She sat down on the sand, and her dog cuddled up to her, licking her wherever he could find a bare piece of skin. I love him awfully, she said. I found him out on the moors when he was just a pup a year ago, and I took him home. At first, Mother liked him, but when he grew bigger, he got terribly naughty. What did he do? asked Anne. Well, he's an awfully chewy kind of dog, said George. He chewed up everything he could. A new rug Mother had bought, her nicest hat, father's slippers, some of his papers and things like that. And he barked too. I liked his bark, but father didn't. He said it nearly drove him mad. He hit Timothy, and that made me angry, so I was awfully rude to him. Did you get spanked? said Anne. I wouldn't like to be rude to your father. He looks fierce. George looked out over the bay. Her face had gone sulky again. Well, it doesn't matter what punishment I got, she said. But the worst part of all was when father said I couldn't keep Timothy any more, and mother backed father up and said Tim must go. I cried for days, and I never do cry, you know, because boys don't, and I like to be like a boy. Boys do cry sometimes, began Anne, looking at Dick, who had been a bit of a crybaby three or four years back. Dick gave her a sharp nudge, and she said no more. George looked at Anne. Boys don't cry, she said obstinately. Anyway, I've never seen one, and I always try not to cry myself. It's so babyish. But I just couldn't help it when Timothy had to go. He cried too. The children looked with great respect at Timothy. They had not known that a dog could cry before. Do you mean he cried real tears? asked Anne. No, not quite, said George. He's too brave for that. He cried with his voice, howled and howled, and looked so miserable that he nearly broke my heart. And then I knew I couldn't possibly part with him. What happened then? asked Julian. I went to Alf, a fisher boy I know, said George, and I asked him if he'd keep Tim for me if I paid him all the pocket money I get. He said he would, and so he does. That's why I never have any money to spend. It all has to go on Tim. He seems to eat an awful lot, don't you, Tim? Woof, said Tim, and rolled over on his back, all his shaggy legs in the air. Julian tickled him. How do you manage when you want any sweets or ice creams, said Anne who spent most of her pocket money on things of that sort. 
I don't manage, said George. I go without, of course. This sounded awful to the other children, who loved ice creams, chocolates and sweets, and had a good many of them. They stared at George. Well, I suppose the other children who play on the beach share their sweets and ices with you sometimes, don't they? asked Julian. I don't let them, said George. If I can never give them any myself, it's not fair to take them. So, I say no. The tinkle of an ice cream man's bell was heard in the distance. Julian felt in his pocket. He jumped up and rushed off jingling his money. In a few moments he was back again, carrying four fat chocolate ice cream bars. He gave one to Dick and one to Anne and then held one up to George. She looked at it longingly but shook her head. No thanks, she said. You know what I just said? I haven't any money to buy them, so I can't share mine with you and I can't take any from you. It's mean to take from people if you can't give even a little back. You can take from us, said Julian, trying to put the ice into George's brown hand. We're your cousins. No thanks, said George again, though I do think it's nice of you. She looked at Julian out of her blue eyes, and the boy frowned as he tried to think of a way to make the obstinate little girl take the ice. Then he smiled. Listen, he said, you've got something we badly want to share. In fact, you've got a lot of things we'd like to share, if only you'd let us. You share those with us, and let us share things like ices with you. See? What things have I got that you want to share? asked George in surprise. You've got a dog, said Julian, patting the big black and white mongrel. We'd love to share him with you. He's such a darling. And you've got a lovely island. We'd be simply thrilled if you'd share it sometimes. And you've got a wreck. We'd like to look at it and share it too. Ices and sweets aren't so good as those things. But it would be nice to make a bargain and share with each other. George looked at the brown eyes that gazed steadily into hers. She couldn't help liking Julian. It wasn't her nature to share anything. She had always been an only child, a lonely, rather misunderstood little girl, fierce and hot-tempered. She had never had any friends of her own. Timothy looked up at Julian and saw that he was offering something nice and chocolatey to George. He jumped up and licked the boy with his friendly tongue. There you are, you see. Tim wants to be shared, said Julian with a laugh. It would be nice for him to have three new friends. Yes, it would, said George, giving in suddenly and taking the chocolate bar. Thank you, Julian. I will share with you. But promise you'll never tell anyone at home that I'm still keeping Timothy. Of course we'll promise, said Julian. But I can't imagine that your father or mother would mind, so long as Tim doesn't live in their house. How's the ice? Is it nice? Ooh! The loveliest one I've ever tasted, said George, nibbling at it. It's so cold. I haven't had one this year. It's simply delicious. Timothy tried to nibble it too. George gave him a few crumbs at the end. Then she turned and smiled at the three children. You're nice, she said. I'm glad you've come after all. 
Let's take a boat out this afternoon and row round the island to have a look at the wreck, shall we? Rather, said all three at once. And even Timothy wagged his tail as if he understood. <laughs>